morning, everybody. It's uh, really a great uh, pleasure to be here with you. Uh, not only because one year ago, more or less, I had the opportunity to visit La Salle University, Mexico, to give a keynote, and, uh, but also because I've been working with uh, La Salle uh, University in Bogota, in Colombia, uh, and uh, in particular, I'm working also with uh, the executive director of IALO, Carlos Cuello, in uh, a project about uh, the relationship between Catholic identity and internationalization. Are the two connected or not? And I will talk in my second part of a presentation about that. Uh, but it's really good to see also from our previous presentation uh, the values that are in the La Salle University network uh, working on community services and uh, uh, sustainable development calls as a kind of driving force. And I've been really learning a lot of my experiences with the La Salle network about how Catholic universities can be working together in a global context to address those issues. That's also, although I'm working at a Jesuit university in Boston College, I'm proud also to wear the jacket of being part of the La Salle team because I really feel connected to your missions and values here. I briefly, but I will do it very shortly also because of time. Unfortunately, I cannot stay with you. I have a, an important international network event at Boston College uh, as of starting tomorrow. Uh, I'll talk about briefly about what our Center of International Higher Education does because like the IALO, it's also a network activity. And then I talk about internationalization in a global context and then I will focus on what does it mean for Catholic universities. So that will be my presentation. The center I am directing was founded in 1995 in Boston College by my predecessor, Philip Albach, uh, a well-known expert in international higher education. And he had the idea that it was important to understand what is the role of higher education in the global context. Because most of the research done on higher education is very local, national, or maybe in some cases regional, but understanding how higher education is reacting to what the world around us and what is the role of higher education in the world was not done in a systematic way as a research center. And at the same time, it was important in his mission, and I share that mission when I succeeded him three years ago, to not do that from an American perspective, or in my case, being originally from the Netherlands, from a European perspective, but understanding higher education in the world in a network relationship of uh, bringing back together scholars from all parts of the world in analyzing what is happening in higher education. So we had that, he had that mission and have been following that mission for the past uh, 23 years. And we do that by research and we have very many different parts uh, of research projects on diversity of higher education systems, doctoral education. Uh, we are currently doing a research, for instance, about family-owned universities around the world because there are many family-owned universities but there have never been done research about what is their role in, the universe, in, the, in higher education. We do it about privatization of higher education, access and equity, all the five factors that have been mentioned uh, from the, uh, UNESCO, and we were even playing an important role in preparing for the UNESCO World Conference on Higher Education as part of our research and analysis. We do all kinds of publications, and I give you an example of one of our flagship publications. Uh, we participate in all kinds of social media. We publish in, uh, in websites like University World News, etc. And we also do education and training. So we train uh, students in a master program and a, uh, a PhD program, but also do training for leaders of higher education around the world. For instance, in, uh, next week we will have a training of 30 leaders of higher education in Latin America who come to Boston College for one week uh, to be trained about developments in international higher education, internationalization of higher education. But we have done that for uh, experts in Russia, in China, in uh, Southeast Asia, in Saudi Arabia, etc. And we do that, as I said, by networking. So all our activities are not done by ourselves alone, but always in cooperation with scholars from Ethiopia, from China, from Russia, from uh, uh, Chile, from Mexico, etc., because we really want to know what are their perspectives and views about internationalization, because there's not one view about what is the right 
higher education system because, as has been said before, but context is very different. And higher education is quite different if you talk about Harvard or Boston College, and even more if you talk about uh, the different uh, countries around the world that higher education is very much context-related. So networking is very important, and that we do with a comparative, a critical, and scholarly and practical perspective. Our flagship uh, publication is International Higher Education. It's published four times a year, and again, it is written by scholars from all over the world that describe what is happening in their countries. So if you want to know about Ethiopia, we have scholars from Ethiopia writing about higher education in Ethiopia. And I mention Ethiopia in particular because you are now having a very important project on the way for established in LaSalle University in Ethiopia. But we do that also in Central Eastern Europe, in, in Asia, in Latin America, etc. And you can subscribe to this newsletter for free. So there's no funding. It's an online newsletter. And you get really the best knowledge about what is happening in higher education around the world. And even you can do it in seven different languages. Because we partner with universities around the world who translate our uh, newsletter in their language. So in Chinese is done by Shanghai Chai Tong, in Spanish by the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, in uh, Russian by the Higher School of Economics, etc., etc. So you can have access to what is happening for free in our uh, Website. And we do it also by other media that we publish, but we have also book series, etc., to understand what is happening. And we have a Master of Arts in International Higher Education, where, again, faculty are not only based in Boston, but we bring in online faculty from all over the world to teach about what is happening in higher education in the world. And we do that similar with a certificate on internationalization of higher education for those who want to further professionalize themselves. So that gives you an idea about networking as an important way to understand what is happening in the global context. You cannot have a one vision, you cannot have a one approach, you need really to bring people together, and that's what you do in the YALU, and that's what we, we try to do in our research activities in higher education as well. And one of our projects has been, for instance, then to study Catholic higher education identity and how they relate to internationalization, and we also are discussing to develop a new inventory for Catholic higher education around the world together with IGLU, uh, with, uh, with uh, yeah, the, the International Federation of Catholic Universities and with the congregation in the Vatican to do that in the future as well. Because we have no idea how many Catholic universities there are, uh, what typology there are, what differences and similarities there are, etc. So one of our research is on that topic as well. The second part more important, internationalization of higher education, the what, the why, and the how. And it's important to understand that internationalization is a very broad and varied concept. Many people, and I come back to that, think about internationalization as mobility of students and scholars only. But there are many other, even more important dimensions to internationalization than only the mobility of students and scholars. Uh, there are branch campuses, there are franchise operations, there are international intercultural learning outcomes, global citizenship development, internationalization at home, internationalization at curriculum. So it's a whole broad concept. It is also a relatively new concept, although even in the Catholic higher education community, international has always been a part of universities. It is not as a strategic part very active until the past 30 years as a response to the globalization of our societies that required to understand the role of higher education and to prepare our students and our faculty to be involved in the international environment. So it's relatively a young strategic concept developed in the late 80s, early 90s by initiatives from the World Bank, the OECD, UNESCO, and I had the honor to be working with those organizations in developing the whole process of what do we mean with internationalization and why it is happening, and try to give you some idea about what is happening there. It's driven by a whole different com combination of rationales. There's not one answer to why universities and colleges have to internationalize. There are political motives, there are economic motives, there are social and cultural motives, there are academic reasons to internationalize, and so it's very important to understand why are you doing this in your context? 
and not think that there is one model that fits all. Eh? Same as we have been saying about LaSalle universities, there's not one LaSalle university which is similar everywhere. Also, internationalization is very different if you talk about a research university, a university of applied sciences, a private university, a community college, a liberal arts college, uh, a university in Latin America or in Africa or in Europe or in Asia. Context is very important to understand what internationalization means. And one of the biggest misconceptions, and there are many more, and I've been writing about that, but one of the most important misconceptions is that internationalization is not a goal in itself. It is a means to enhance the quality of what we higher education do in our education, in our research, and also in our service to our societies. We have to look at internationalization as very integrated in the overall mission of the university. And if we don't do that, then internationalization becomes something ad hoc and marginal. Then we have an international office that deals with the international and the rest of the university is dealing with all kind of local and national issues. That's not anymore the case. International is in all aspects of the university, in all schools, in all faculties, in human resources, in financing, in academic affairs, in student affairs. Everywhere there is an international dimension. And we have to understand that how does that relate to the quality of what we are doing as to be strategic. What are some of the key trends when we talk about internationalization over the past 30 years? And we have been doing a study uh, for uh, the European Parliament that wanted to understand that for all their activities like the Erasmus program and Horizon 2020. And they asked us, can you tell us what are the trends with internationalization of higher education? And we did that in 2015. Uh, we came with six major trends. One is growing importance of internationalization at all levels. We know from surveys like the one by the International Association of Universities that around two-thirds of universities around the world have now an internationalization strategy or have integrated the internationalization in the overall strategy of the universities. We also see that organizations like UNESCO, the World Bank, the European Commission, uh, the ASEAN countries are all very active in developing internationalization strategies. And we see increasingly that also national governments are developing strategies for internationalization of higher education. Colombia has a strategy, South Africa has a strategy, Malaysia has one, uh, Canada has one, Denmark, the Netherlands, etc. You see increasingly that national governments are also saying, well, internationalization in higher education is becoming a very important aspect of our national agenda. So at all levels, internationalization is becoming imp important. Unfortunately, we also see there's a two, uh, an increasing privatization of internationalization. Uh, internationalization has become for many governments and institutions a commercial product. Recruitment of international students for income uh, generation. Uh, Australia is a very clear example with uh, being international students, the second export commodity of the country. The United Kingdom, uh, we have seen in the United States that many states and uh, public universities, small colleges have been looking at international students to compensate for the lack of public funding in higher education. So there is a trend, unfortunately, also to commercialization and privatization of internationalization. We also see an increasing pressure of rankings. Rankings driving the agenda of internationalization. Uh, uh, universities want to increase their position in the global rankings, in the national rankings and the regional rankings. And then they look at what indicators there are for internationalization. The number of international students, the number of international scholars and the number of co-publications are the driving force. So what is internationalization then as a strategy? We have to increase the number of international students, we have to increase the number of international scholars and we have to increase the number of co-publications internationally. But that's a very limited approach to internationalization and a very quantitative approach. And we see that if you drive, let yourself dri driven by those agendas, you don't look at the quality of what you're going to do. And that can have very disastrous impacts on your local students, on your resources you use, etc. So rankings play a role, unfortunately, also in the internationalization process. And by that we see 
a shift moving from a much more cooperative approach for internationalization, uh, cooperation and exchange of students, cooperation and exchange of scholars, uh, joint curriculum programs, uh, all uh, joint research, etc., to a much more competi competitive approach. We compete for international students, we compete for international top scholars and for talents, we compete for funding, we compete for access to publications, we compete for positions in rankings. That is unfortunately driving very much in the higher education community in the world in this internationalization. And while that happens, we see that numbers are rising. The number of students that go and study in other countries is rising. We now have uh, approximately 5 million students studying in other country than the home country for a degree. Uh, we see the number of uh, scholars moving around. We see the number of uh, uh, courses taught in English because of the language of uh, communication in higher education increasingly, unfortunately, is going to be in English. Uh, we see this whole quantitative approach, but it's very important that we also address the quality of what we are doing. And that's still high on the agenda to change in the future. What we also see is a shift away from the dominance of a Western approach to internationalization to a much more globalization of internationalization process. We see that increasingly countries and institutions of higher education in Latin America, Africa and Asia are also internationalizing their higher education and are doing it their own way and not let themselves driven by the dominance of the Western model that they say, well, you have to bring your students to our countries because there they get the best education. Uh, you have to uh, have the brain drain of scholars and students coming to our countries. No, we see now that increasingly there are also new developments of countries like uh, Malaysia, uh, India, China, South Africa, uh, Ethiopia, etc. that try to say, well, what can we do? How can we internationalize higher education? And in that, a network like LaSalle uh, network is very important to learn from its other and not to see its other as being in a different hierarchical position. So when we talk about internationalization, it's very important to ask yourself first the question, why are we doing that? Why are we doing that for your specific university, for being a Salinian university? What makes that different? Why are we in our context internationalizing? And you have to make an analysis of the context to do that. And only then you can ask yourself, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Always skipping a mind, but how does that improve the quality of what we are doing? So what is the outcomes and the impact accepted? The reality is that most institutions start with the what and the how and forget about the why and the outcomes. And it's very important that you have to have a more strategic approach to a comprehensive internationalization. Because context, as has been said, is very important. And it's not only the institutional context, but the national context, the regional context, and the, and the context in the global, uh, in global environment. Where are you positioning? It makes a huge difference if you are a university in Ethiopia than you, if you are a university in the United States to internationalize. You have to understand that and you have to work on that, so that's very important. And you have to involve your stakeholders, not only your faculty and your students, but also your alumni and your employers where you are going to work, your local governments, etc., to be involved. It's essential to make that analysis very carefully. If we talk about internationalization, as I said before, Many people say internationalization is similar to international students and international scholars. But there are a whole other list, as I said, from other activities that are increasingly more important to put attention to. And I give you some examples of definitions of what these concepts are as a strategy to internationalize. First of all, internationalization of the curriculum. We have an Australian expert, Betty Lisk, uh, who is an, uh, has been doing a lot of research on internationalization of the curriculum. And she says internationalization of the curriculum is the process of incorporating international, intercultural and global dimensions into the content of the curriculum, but also in the learning outcomes, the assessment of those learning outcomes, the teaching methods that you use and the support services of a program of study. 
internationalization of the curriculum is essential because internationalization of the curriculum allows that your local students, your own students, can understand what is happening in the world. And you can bring international students and international scholars to help with that, but you have to bring in all the different dimensions into the curriculum to really create global citizens and global professionals. Very closely related to that is the concept of internationalization at home. Internationalization at home as a concept was developed in the late 1990s as a reaction to the focus on mobility in Europe, where people said, but only five to 10% of our students will go abroad. What about the other 90 or 95%? Currently in Europe, we have been increasing it to something like 20%, but still that means that 80% will not have an international study experience. So if you focus your strategy only on mobility abroad, then you only reach a small percentage. 20% is still a lot. If you look to the United States, it's less than 10%. If you look to Mexico, it's less than 1%. If you in general look to Asia, Africa, and Latin America, it's around 1% to 2%. So if you focus your strategy of internationalization only on mobility of students, and I'm not saying that mobility of students is bad in itself, it's life-changing experience. I was a student in Peru for one year and I've been learning a lot of it when I was a student. So, but it's only possible for a small elite of students and scholars to have that opportunity. And so we have to focus on internationalization at home. And they define it as the purposeful integration of an international intercultural dimension, the formal and informal curriculum for all students within a domestic environment. So that the curriculum, the formal curriculum, but also what the university does outside of the curriculum, creating a campus environment of internationalization, uh, uh, doing all kinds of international activities like a film festival or uh, food, etc. that all brings an environment of internationalization at home uh, for the students in the campus. And that's very important because then you reach all students uh, in your internationalization strategy. The rationale for internationalization of the curriculum, internationalization at home, and again, those two concepts are very closely related, is that all students will live and work as graduates in an increasingly interconnected, globalized world. As professionals, yeah, economic beings, but also as citizens and social and human beings. And solving the problems of the world will require international and intercultural knowledge, international and intercultural communication skills, and the development of critical thinking, as well as a commitment to ethical practice, global responsibility, and local action. And so, if internationalization is not focusing also on internationalization curriculum, internationalization at home, we might, although it's even there not a guarantee, have a very small elite group of students and scholars that might be global professionals and global thinkers, but we need all our students given the challenge that we are faced for, to become global professionals and global citizens. So that's why it's so important to change the shift from thinking about internationalization as mobility to also focusing on curriculum and teaching and learning. Research. There's not been much discussion about internationalization of research because many researchers in general thought internationalization of research by nature is international, so we don't have to have a strategy. But research has become very complex. Research requires also global cooperation. Research provides global funding. Research provides global access. So you need to develop a whole kind of list of activities as an institution also to define a strategy for internationalization of research. A clear institutional policy of how to do that, support mechanisms and systems, uh, the graduate level internationalization by bringing in uh, international PhD students and international scholars and helping your own PhD students and scholars to have an international exposure, creating a policy for visiting faculty, creating a policy for uh, hiring faculty and PhDs, uh, support mechanisms for international research networking, like you do already in the in IALU, uh, and development of support for translation, for instance, of articles to get access to peer-reviewed journals. All that seems very obvious, but many institutions don't have really a strategy for doing that. And so it's important to develop that. And last but not least, university social responsibility is another dimension of internationalization. 
and you as LaSalle universities do a lot of work in having a social responsibility to your communities and to service them and help them in your work. But not many universities do that these days. And it's very important that we understand that all those social responsibility activities are not only local problems, but are increasingly also global problems. Health, poverty, climate change, all those sustainable development goals defined by the United Nations are important to look into a global context. And so to work together to solve those problems is very important. And that's why it's so good that you have that as part of your mission as well, but you are exceptional in doing that. Partnerships and networking is not a very important dimension of internationalization. We see, again there, quantity is much more driving the agenda than quality. Many universities are very proud that they have 500, 800, 1,000 of memorandums of understanding. Every time the rector is going to travel or the director of international office is going to travel, he signs a memorandum of understanding or she signs a memorandum of understanding. Many of those agreements are not active agreements. We have been doing research on that and in general you might be happy if 20% of those agreements have some kind of activity. So we are losing a lot of paperwork and traveling, etc., in not very effective partnerships. It's much more important to help to develop strategic partnerships, looking how you can work together in curriculum development, in student exchange, in faculty exchange, in research collaboration, and in sustainable development. Looking how you can be strategic, and this is a strategic network, so you're doing that. So you are a good example of how you can do that. Look at the same kind of people. Not, not try to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Ivy League in the United States. Eh? You can work together with them on an individual basis, but they are not interested in you. They're interested maximally in your knowledge and your experience. So try to play on the same level field, of working strategic partnerships to do that. And don't make it only something of the leadership of the university, but include the faculty as a driving force for making those networks working. And that's again what you are trying to do as well. So in summary, talking about internationalization, we still see that the most of the focus is on mobility of students. And much of that focus has a short-term income focus, like Australia, United Kingdom, etc. Some have another different approach. Take for instance Germany. Germany invests millions of euros in, develop, in recruiting international students. But they don't charge tuition fees, so they, they lose money on recruiting international students. Why do they do that? For two reasons. One is that they think that the graduates that come from German universities and go back to their countries will be the ambassadors for the economy, will be the ambassadors for their political position, and so will have a long-term uh, political impact and economic impact. And the second reason, more recently, is that we see in many countries, including Germany, but also Japan, United States, Canada, uh, other European countries, that we have a shortage of own talents. So they say, well, we bring in those students because they can fill the places that our economy and our society needs. Uh, that's also the reason why, at first, Germany was very positive about bringing in the Syrian refugees. Because they thought, well, these refugees are educated and they can work in our healthcare, they can work in our industry, etc. And only when there came too many, then there was the resistance coming uh, forward. There. But there was a clear, not only humanitarian approach to that, but there was a clear economic and political approach to bringing in those refugees. And that's what we see increasingly the talent recruitment as a driving force for internationalization, with, of course, all the negative impacts of brain drain uh, from those countries that need those talents for their own development. And that's one of the big challenges that we say as well. And I mentioned also the important role of rankings as a negative part, but what we still don't see too much is a comprehensive approach to internationalization, focusing very much on internationalization of the curriculum and learning outcomes to enhance the quality of what we are doing. And so we were looking, when we did a study for European Parliament, 
with experts from all over the world. We had 180 experts asking them, if you would define what internationalization means for the future, what would you then give us a description? And they said, it has to be much more inclusive and less elitist. So we cannot focus on only five or 10% of the students and scholars. It has to be focusing on all students. We still think mobility is fine, but it has to be much more a part of the curriculum and teaching and learning process. It should not be academic tourism. It should re-emphasize that internationalization, not a goal in itself, but a means to enhance the quality of what we are doing, and it should not be focused only by economic rationales. And so they came with the following definition, and it's built on a definition by my colleague uh, Jay Knight from the University of Toronto, which you see in the, uh, uh, as part of it. Uh, the original definition was the process of integrating international, intercultural, or global dimension to the purpose, functions, delivery of post-secondary education. This was a very generally accepted definition and still works pretty well. But we said if you look at the future, we have to add some text to it. We have to make it intentional. It doesn't go that process by itself. You have to be intentional in doing it. As universities, as networks, as governments, you have to make it happen. And you have to do it with a purpose. And the purpose is to enhance the quality of education and research for all students and staff, so not being elitist, and to make a meaningful contribution to society, to the sustainable development goals. That definition gives us direction on how to internationalize. What does that mean for Catholic universities? And as I said, we did a study over the past two years, uh, funded by the Luxec Fund, a Chilean fund, uh, and collaboration between uh, the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, Boston College, and the Universidad Católica de Sacra Cora in Milan. And we did first a pilot study among the three universities and then got extra funding to do a broader study on this topic. And we said we do identity and internationalization in Catholic universities. And the book, which here you have the cover, will come out uh, somewhere in August. And via the Carlos, we will be also giving you access to how you can order the book at a discount of 20%, because we think it's important that Catholic universities have the possibility to, uh, to access. But I'll briefly tell you what happened in that. We thought that internationalization is so important, uh, but we do should not neglect the identity of the university. As I said, context is very important. So if you only have an internationalization strategy but not related to your mission, uh, that's wrong. And there are many Catholic universities that consider themselves to be Catholic, but and they have by that unique missions and visions and strategies. But how much is that related to the internationalization practice? How that reflects in what they are doing? And I must say, when we started the study, we were already very skeptical that there was a strong relationship between the two in the in university. So we wanted to see, is our skepticism about the fact that there is no relation between their Catholic identity and their Catholic mission and the internationalization strategy, is that true? And what is where is it different and where is it happening? So we did the study to explore that relationship and we asked ourselves several questions about what is the rationale for internationalization of Catholic University? Where is it driven by? What, is, what drives them? Uh, should there be a relationship with the student experience and the identity? Uh, how do they partner? Are they mainly partnering with other Catholic universities or within the Catholic universities between La Salle universities and the Jesuit University, etc. What is the influence of the context of being a Catholic university and what is the role of associations of Catholic universities? So you wanted to know what would happen. So we decided to do 16 case studies, five from Latin America, including this university, uh, one from the United States, Boston College. Uh, we had originally the plan to add some others, but Notre Dame and some others dropped out. Three from the Asia-Pacific region, in the Catholic University of Australia, the St. Paul University in the Philippines, and uh, the third one is uh, Sofia University in uh, Japan, and seven from Europe, from all over Europe. We also 
did some study about Catholic higher education and how they internationalize at the, at the regional level between Latin America, Europe, and United States, and on the specific role, because it was originally funded by, uh, 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 to do it, focus on Jesuit universities, also what the role of Jesuit universities was. But since Jesuit universities are less internationally working together, we looked at an alternative, and then we became aware of Ayalu via this university, and so we asked uh, if um, there would also be a case study about the role of La Salle universities in the global context, and uh, we were very glad that we would have this example of the positive way how uh, Catholic universities can work together in a global context. What are some of our findings? And I give also some of the key findings. More than being a, a Jesuit university or La Salle university, what are factors played in a role why uh, how universities respond to their relationship? Independent institutions, so who are not uh, related to uh, the Jesuit order or the La Salle uh, order, uh, but were basically founded to be Catholic without having that relationship, seem to have a less explicit Catholic focus in their identity and also in their internationalization. So there is not a very strong connection in those ones. Uh, and also, if you look at networks, they are present, but in reality, Ayalo is the only one that has a strong global work. The Association of Jesuit University and Colleges now is meeting uh, in July in uh, Bilbao at the University of Justo to try to develop a global network, uh, but still it's very difficult because there's too much competition even between the Jesuit universities to really to work together. So it will be an issue. We also found out that IFCU and other associations still have a very marginal role in linking identity and internationalization. We have some discussions with IFCU uh, now to see if we can help them to work out how to increase that reality. Context again came out as very important. Yeah. For instance, is the university settled in a Catholic environment or where Catholic religion is a minority? Uh, compare, for instance, Sophia University in Japan, which is basically Catholic, a very small percentage of the population, or St. Paul University in the Philippines, which is predominantly Catholic. That context creates a completely different role in how you internationalize your strategy. Is it a highly ranked university or not? And is it a research university or not? It's very important. Uh, we had two cases from Chile, the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and Alberto Hurtado University in Santiago. Book de Chile is a highly ranked research university. And for them, their international strategy and their Catholic identity are completely unrelated because they are much more focused on their international positioning than on their Catholic identity in the international strategy. Where Alberto Hurtado is not a highly ranked university, it's very based in the local community, and for them, internationalization means how they can create sustainable development goals and development strategies based on that. So that plays a very important role. Uh, uh, you can also say, for instance, that in the United States, Boston College and Georgetown University, as two Jesuit universities, are considering themselves as research universities in the top level of the United States and look down a little bit at the other Jesuit universities as well. Uh, we also noticed that young universities are much more using internationalization to partner with other Catholic universities in particular uh, in their own denominations. So uh, the Justo, for instance, an old traditional Jesuit university, is not so focused on the international relations with other Catholic universities. But uh, Loyola Andalusia, which is a very recent university, sees internationalization and partnering with other Catholic universities as a way to develop their own strategy, etc. So context is very important. In a more secular society, the Catholic identity is less dominant than in other contexts. Take, for instance, Tilburg University in the Netherlands, which is a Catholic university, which nearly doesn't use its Catholic identity, where the Catholic University in Lublin in Poland is a very strongly Catholic identified university in their context. In some cases, even 
like in the Catholic University of uh, Sacracore in Milan and in the Catholic University of Australia and in Tilburg, they even ignore to mention their Catholic identity as part of their internationalization strategy. Uh, we found out, and uh, they are changing that now, that in Milan, for instance, they use not Universidad Católica de Sacra Core de Milan when they are advertising on their website in English, but they use the acronym only, because they thought that would be negatively impacting their relationship with other countries. So you see that sometimes universities really have uh, uh, a kind of negative view on how internationalization can be related to the Catholic identity. But on the positive side, we see that identity becomes increasingly more important now in the current political climate, which I have been mentioning before, uh, uh, with all the nationalist populist developments, the anti-immigration, the role with the refugees, we see that more and more universities which are having a Catholic identity from the past are now coming back to think about the Catholic identity. So that's a positive development that we have been noticing as well. Key findings in general are that there is not a very strong relationship between the Catholic identity and the internationalization. Interestingly, it is more present in the internationalization of the curriculum than in the mobility and in the partnerships. In internationalization of the curriculum, although more implicit than explicit, there's reference to the values and the identity of being a Catholic university uh, in the way you develop your undergraduate cu uh, curriculum. So implicitly there is a relationship there, uh, because there the importance of being universal, the role of the Catholic Church in, the, in, in, in global development is present, although never directly mentioned. But what we notice that in mobility and partnerships, it's in most cases rather marginal. There are many universities uh, that have uh, only a very small percentage of partnerships with Catholic universities, although they are themselves Catholic. So there is a tendency just to look differently at how you partnership than thinking about your identity. I don't want to say that it would be necessary that Catholic universities or La Salle universities should only work with La Salle University or Catholic universities. It's good that you have relationships all over the board. But the fact that you do the opposite and ignore the possibilities of having a global network, that is and now I feel very counterproductive. So in that sense, IALO is a good example of a lot of different ways. As I said, young Catholic universities in that sense much more use their identity to focus on their international focus. But what we also find out, there's a tension between the business model and the reputation model and their uh, identity as being a Catholic university in the international strategy. If you have a business model, it means that you want to recruit international students only to generate income. And I give you the example of my own university, Boston College. We don't give financial aid to undergraduate international students. The result is that the international students who come to Boston College come from very rich families in not Catholic countries, China, India. Uh, India has a Catholic population, of course, importantly, but, uh, but they don't come from Latin America. They don't come from Africa. Uh, and that is because they cannot afford it. And so we have been discussing with the leadership of Boston College, well, there is a tension between your business model, your Catholic identity, and your internationalization strategy. And now they are reconsidering how they are going to do that. And one of the proposals in the new strategic plan now is that they will give graduates from Jesuit high schools around the world, in particular from Africa and Latin America and the Middle East, uh, financial aid to come to Boston College as to solve that problem in their identity. So you see a direct result of this kind of activities, how you can improve the quality. There's also this tension which I mentioned between reputation, high uh, research universities, high in the ranking, and your, in, your identity. That also has an impact on internationalization. Interestingly, Catholic University in Greece see also a role in interfaith dialogue. So not only working with Catholic universities and other non-Catholic, uh, non-religious universities, but they sometimes even are more interested in collaborating with 
uh, Islamic universities and Jewish universities and Protestant evangelical universities than with their own Catholic universities. And I think that's in itself a positive way because the interfaith dialogue is a very important uh, dimension as well. And one of our next studies is, will be about how is the relationship between interfaith, uh, higher education, and internationalization. So clearly, the key finding is that there is no relationship between Catholic identity and internationalization, only in implicit values like uh, social justice, human rights, you find some focus on the internationalization, and we also think that sustainable development goals might be a new way how to do that. And one of our, or to say, well, in essence, one of the tensions that you see in the whole relationship between the two is between universities with a capital C in their Catholic and a non-capital C in their, in, their, uh, in their Catholic as their focus. So if you are very strongly identified with your Catholic identity, then your internationalization is much more developed than if you are not having a strong Catholic identity, then there is no relationship at all. And the whole area in between is very gray. So what are possible uh, directions? And this comes from an, another publication about Catholic uh, faith-based education in broader sense, is delivery and outreach to underserved populations like you do as well with the refugees and minority groups and developing countries, uh, is one way how you can, as Catholic universities, develop your internationalization strategy. Uh, specific education outreach to refugees and displaced persons. Curricular fo focus on pluralism and religious literacy. So focusing on what is the role of religion in society and how can religion help to create a pluralist society is very important and addressing education challenges surrounding values in education and understanding of citizenship. So how can you create an internationalization of the curriculum, internationalization at home that prepares your students to become global professionals and global citizens? That's another important agenda that can come out of that discussion. With that, I end my presentation and uh, wish you uh, very three fruitful uh, days and I'm pretty sure that your network will be growing and playing a very important role in the future of higher education in the global context to really help to solve the global challenges that we are doing in diversity, but also in the strength of your cooperation. Thank you very much.